Welcome to the Swarm and Shoot podcast, episode five. I'm Manny Matsakis, and I would like to introduce to you Javon Johnson. How are you doing, Javon? I'm doing good, Coach. Well, it's, this is uh, going to be a lot of fun for us. We've got an opportunity to talk a little bit about your background uh, initially, so our fans out there can get a chance to know you. And, um, you know, pretty much you grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania, and uh, just give us a little background of how you got into playing the sport of football. Uh, growing up, I wasn't really a big football guy. I played basketball all the way up until the eighth grade. And my best friends at the time, they asked me to come out because they needed a quarterback for the football team. And I, I was skeptical at first, kind of hesitant because I wasn't really used to people tackling me and, and being mm-hmm. on the field. Uh, but eventually, I started to throw the ball around, and the coach thought that I was I would be a good fit for playing quarterback in uh, eighth grade. Just when it all took place, and uh, our football team that year went undefeated, and I, I like to think that I played a good part of that. Yeah, oh, quarterbacks do that, you know. And it's funny because like here, you're our defensive backs coach, and we'll talk more about that later. But it, it's interesting, you leave Erie and you go to the University of Iowa. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the Iowa Hawkeyes, and what got you to go so far away from college uh, to have that experience in the Big Ten? I mean, I think it was the environment. You know, I I knew two guys from Erie that were currently attending the University of Iowa already previous to me coming there. Uh, So it felt like it was a a home environment for me. I knew those guys would take care of me, and they would make sure that I was on the right path to do the things that I needed to do, Uh, given that they came from the same environment that I did. They kind of had an idea of of how to get things done, and they led by example, and also teaching me how to do things the right way. And I think that's what um, that that's what triggered me to go to Iowa instead of going to Kent State, which I verbally committed to uh, my senior season in high school. Oh, okay. So I got you. So you could have been a Golden Flash, but you became a Hawkeye. I definitely could have been a Golden Flash. (laughs) I got it. Okay. So, so you, you go out to Iowa, you're all, all big 10, all four years in a row playing corner. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you had a lot of success there. And then when, when that was over, then you had a shot in the national football league Yeah. and, uh, take us through what it was like to go from college to your first shot in the pros. Oh, it was an experience. You know, it was a learning curve. Uh, something that I, I had to uh, develop of how to actually do things at the professional level versus doing them in the college uh, level. So um, it took a little bit of adjustment. Uh, but one thing about Iowa is their program develops you to be prepared for the next level. And I think our defensive back coach did a great job of teaching me the fundamentals and techniques to be able to carry my athletic ability more so than and then rely on it. So I think uh, that's what prepared me the most. But uh, being in the NFL was was quite the experiment. Um, the first my first go round with the New York Jets. Uh, was was definitely an obstacle that I had to to learn how to deal with adversity and uh, it was probably the first time in my career that you know things didn't go the way that I had planned for them to go uh, getting released three times in five weeks from a professional team uh, kind of kills your your morale and uh, confidence so um, I but I didn't give up and I stayed the course so mm. So after the Jets, then what happened? And then after I got released the last time at the end of the preseason from the New York Jets, uh, I signed with the Steelers who originally had called during a draft and they were going to draft me. And they asked me to come in as an unrestricted free agent uh, or uh, undrafted free agent. And um, that process kind of took a turn to the to the left because I thought that that's where I was going to sign out of college. But my agent sent me to New York. And then I went through that tobacco and then ended up a Steeler anyway. So had I went to the Steelers originally, I probably would have played there a lot longer. Uh, But they signed a guy in place of me once I signed with the Jets. And and that that guy went on to play four or five years and win two Super Bowls with the Steelers. So. Wow. Yeah. Timing is everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no doubt. And then after that, you, you got a chance to go up to the Canadian Football League. And that's where you and I met. Right. It was uh, when I was at Winnipeg with the Blue Bombers in 2009. You were playing def- defensive back for us, your corner. And, and um, you know, I, I think it's interesting because Mike Kelly, who was the head coach at the time, yeah. you know, we're sitting here 
talking about you and and I'm thinking oh wow yeah I remember him in college and then we see you play and it was tremendous and you know you had quite a career up there I, I mean um when really what's amazing to me is playing corner I think it was 2011 you were the defensive player of the year mm -hmm. in the whole league in the Canadian Football League and that's in in all the time and a lot of people don't realize the CFL has been around longer than the National Football League. And there's never been a defensive back win that award and, until you did it. Yeah. So, so which is, which gives you an idea, our fans out there, just the type of uh, tenacity and expertise you have to have to be named a defensive player of the year playing corner on a field that is wider than what we're used to down here. And uh, you get exposed a lot up there if, if you can't play well. So, you know, what was, um, you know, you, you most of your career you spent at Winnipeg and in Saskatchewan, yes. right? Okay, g give us the because those are like rivals. Yeah, uh, you know it's like you know it's the Ohio State, Michigan. It's the you name it, uh, Defiance College, Bluffton. I mean, it's it's the rival game. They call it the Banjo Bowl, right? Mm -hmm. So you probably play in a few Banjo Bowls. Oh yeah, yeah. So what what is that like? Uh, have when the two teams that you played with the most up there were rivals for each other. How did it feel going from one city to the next? Uh, you could feel the, the energy when you, when you get to that other stadium, uh, whatever team you play on, uh, when you get to the other team's stadium is, is, is a culture shock. You got to be prepared. You got to be able to focus because the, the fans could take over your confidence level real quick. They're, they're right on top of you and they're heckling you the whole game. So you better get ready for it. it. It's one of those, you know, blood baths. You got to go out there ready to fight f to the death. And um, and those guys uh, on the teams that I've been on were tremendous. But that rivalry is something. It's, it's something special. Oh yeah, you know, I can remember that year when I was up there playing that because you you like I I think. You go to one and then you come back and you play at your place. So yeah. it's like back to back. Home and home. Yeah. So you've got a very interesting situation. And the beauty of it, I think, and we were talking about this the other day, it's like, you know, Saskatchewan and Winnipeg are arguably the two best fan bases in that whole league. Yes. And, and you know, so you're talking about the passion up there. And it's like, wow, I got, first time I was in Saskatchewan, I look, at, they have a beautiful stadium now, and it's uh, quite a setup. And, you know, they're all well, wearing, the fans are wearing those watermelon <laughs> heads you know and, and for our fans take a look at it and just google it online and hit saskatchewan rough riders and the um you know the watermelon head and you'll see pictures images of that oh yeah and uh i'd never seen that i didn't quite get what that was about but i certainly got what it was about when you saw the energy brought in that game oh yeah that yeah. energy is is something to be a part of especially as a player on the field to be able to be out there and and hearing the crowd, both stadiums, no matter which mm -hmm. one you're at, like the the energy is just there. Like you can feel it as soon as you walk in. It's it's unbelievable. Yeah, no, there's no question. And, and I think as you, you know, recap some of your time in the Canadian League playing up there, because you just finished a year ago with mm -hmm. Saskatchewan. And, um, you know, when you think about some of the best uh, receivers that you had to face up there, uh -huh. and uh, I think – some of our fans might not realize how many great players head north to play, you know, and, and, and what, what are like the top couple receivers that you had to face uh, in the Canadian football league? Oh, uh, some of the best guys. Uh, a lot of them were teammates. Some of them were uh, opponents, but guys like G Roy Simon, who's a hall of fame guy up there. Uh, Milt Stiegel mm. who's also a hall of fame guy up there. Arlen Bruce, uh, you name it, Terrence Edwards. Uh, we had some yeah. guys, you know, Jamel Richardson and, and the guys that are great Montreal days, S.J. Green. You know, these guys are 10,000-plus are receivers in the CFL, uh, guys that have made a name for themselves up north and, and done things the right way and uh, broke all types of records and, 
you know, you, you'd be surprised when, when you got quarterbacks up there that threw for more yards than NFL guys, Hall of Fame guys, a guy like Anthony Calvillo. You mm -hmm. know, those, those type of guys are guys who had shots in the NFL that went north to play because for whatever reason but they made the most of their opportunity and, and those are the guys that that are now considered greats in that league up there oh yeah and, and i think what's fun right now is uh since football doesn't really start you know south of the border to the to our canadian friends uh you know we don't really get going until end of august september mm -hmm. and and they're like at mid-season mm -hmm. when we start our games here yeah. And uh, so I've always enjoyed, you know, getting online. ESPN2 a lot of times will play the games yeah. on and they're live. And I always look and see which games are on. And and uh, it, it's 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 really neat. So as we're as this podcast is out there, the CFL season is right in the midst of like it's hot and heavy. You know, and there's a lot going on. So I always like to watch it. I urge our fans to watch it because it, it's an exciting brand of football, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it's different. Uh, you know, you got so many different rule changes, um, one being that you only play with three downs instead of four, which makes the game a lot different than, than a lot of people are used to. It's a lot harder to get first downs than it is uh, with four downs. So that's a big difference. And, and then they play with the field goal post in the front of the end zone versus the back. So you got to be kind of weary of that when you get in the red zone because I've seen a couple guys run into the field goal post, which <laughs> – you know, it's unfortunate, but but yeah. teams use that as a as a tool for their advantage, and the field's a lot bigger. The end zones are twenty yards in comparison to ten. So, if you have the ball in the one yard line, you can still run any route in your playbook, and that that makes it a lot harder to defend. And uh, as a defensive back in that league, you know, with the wide field, you you're running a lot and and chasing guys and. Um, and a lot of mesh routes and those type of concepts are things that, you know, you got to be ready for and you got to be where you're supposed to be at or otherwise you'll get exposed real fast. Yeah, no no doubt, Javon. It's, it's just funny because it's like when I was up there, I really – I didn't really totally – I knew the league. I'd heard of it. I'd never really – watched much of it before now it's like i love and i enjoy watching it because the creativity of what's going on up there it's like a lot of these concepts like we sit down here in the united states and we coach the game and you know, i don't know a few years ago like for example somebody said oh well, these things called rpos i'm like that's like 30 years ago in Canada. Yeah. You know, it's like they were so far ahead. There's so many concepts like zone blitzes. It's like, OK, yeah, we did that in the 60s up there, you know, and then they start yeah. thinking we don't realize a lot of the game is invented or really experimented with invented, created north of the border. And those concepts come down here because some of those coaches are doing it up there. Then they come down here to coach and they start to play with all that. Because, like, the thing that's amazing to me is from a defensive perspective, it's like you're dealing with these the waggles. You know, all these guys can go in motion. You know, if they're on the line, they can go this way. If they're, you know, if they're in the backfield, they can attack at the line of scrimmage. And it's like, you know how fast – a guy runs a 40, let's say. This is how I started thinking about how hard it is to play defense. It's like, let's say a guy runs a 4-4, four, 4-5, four, four, right? But if you give him a flying start and clock him, it's about a 3-6. Yeah. You know, he's, that's how fast he's coming <laughs> yeah. at you. And you're in oh, defense. Yeah. And how do you play against that kind? The speed, it's different. It, in fact, because of the waggle, I believe – the speed in the Canadian league is way faster than the national football league because they get those flying starts. Oh yeah. That flying start makes a big difference, especially when you get a guy who's experienced with the waggle and know how to use it effectively. It makes it a lot tougher to guard. But uh, I think for defensive backs, the thing to that is you have to be good with your feet and your eyes at all times because, you know, a guy will sell you one way and, and try to beat you inside or sell you the other way and beat you outside. Uh, if you're good with your eyes and your feet uh, and you play kind of like a basketball technique on it, it doesn't it doesn't make you. Uh, panic as long as you don't panic as much i think you'll be okay it's just you got to get your hands on though when you're in press coverage otherwise you're gonna get burned 
Yeah, yeah, it's just fun. So, once again, urge our fans take a look at ESPN oh, yeah. two, ESPN. Their games are all on in the in the uh, in the summer. Take, yeah, take it's out. a lot that's, of fun. Yeah, it, it's exciting. neat, and that's sort of how I get prepped for the season. I watch a little CFL, get your creative juices flowing, and all that. So, oh, yeah. you know, I would like to just well, let's let's take a moment here and hear a word from our sponsor, and when we come back, we're going to take a good uh, understanding. I want to get some like how you think about coaching defensive backs. So after this, we'll be right back. This is Manny Matsakis, the head football coach of the Defiance College Yellow Jackets. Defiance College is located in beautiful Northwest Ohio. We have a tremendous campus here and we're led by Dr. Rich Ann Mankey, our president. Her team has created a renaissance here in recent years that has built our reputation on academics and student life. We have a wonderful opportunity here for you to find your life's calling. Make sure for you to become a Yellow Jacket, you take the time to contact one of our friendly admissions counselors so they can walk you through the process to find your life's calling and become a Yellow Jacket. One. Welcome back to the Swarm and Shoot podcast with uh, Jovan Johnson, our defensive back coach. And Jovan, it's um, it's interesting. We were we were talking in San Antonio at the American Football Coaches Association convention, and you had said, "Hey, I would like to get into coaching." Yep. And uh, I think we were down there. I'm trying to think who were we, Fred Reed was down there Fred with Reed. us, right? Yeah. Yeah. Who played there. running back for us when I was in Winnipeg? Yep. And uh, he he's doing a great job coaching down in in uh, where is he Tampa, right now? in Middleton. Yeah, in Middleton, Middleton High, High School, School in mm-hmm. Tampa. Talk about I mean that's another that's another podcast. We got to get Fred on this because it's like he is a fantastic running back for us. And uh, yeah, he set I, th- I think the Winnipeg Blue Bomber record for the most yards in a game. Yeah. Uh, against against the BC Lions that game I'll never forget that I'll never forget it either <laughs> <laughs> he was sick man him him and uh, YB Evanson Bernard yeah you know they were just they did a heck of a job that day Coach Kelly called a good game and it was, it was fun they they averaged over like ten yards per attempt every rush it was crazy what we were doing but that was fun and and but is we were talking in San Antonio and you wanted to get into coaching and. In the back of my mind, I think like I I already had a position. I was looking at some other people, and then you showed up like on the radar. I'm thinking like, okay, you know, I'm like I I hadn't been with you since 2009. I knew the way that people respected you in the league as a as a as a guy in the locker room that was a leader and a great teammate. And I knew you were a technician, so that's that's like number one. Defensive backs, if your DB coach isn't a technician, you're going to get exposed, especially when you do some things we like to do. Yeah. And um, you know, we were talking about that, and I remember calling Coach Kelly, and I said, "Well, what do you think?" And he literally went on for about 20 minutes about how you can't go wrong. He's going to be great, even though he hasn't done the recruiting and stuff yet. He's going to pick it up, and you have. You're going to understand the the concept of this thing and the work ethic involved because you worked at it so hard as a player to play until you were basically, what, 34, 35? 35. 35. I ended the last season at 35. Yeah, and, you know, and – to, to play that long in the pros at a position like corner, it's not like playing quarterback. I mean, that's a totally different position. So you had to be a technician. And and now as our defensive backs coach, when you think about technique, in the spring we had some time to work with some of our young guys and all that, and they they're so much from where they are to where you want them to be How do you, what do you look for in a defensive back? What are you trying to develop to get a defensive back to play in our type of scheme? Well, first and foremost, you know, you want to look for guys who have a short-term memory, guys who can condition their mind to do things over and over and over again and be consistent at doing it the effective way all the time. Uh, Guys that, you know, when they backpedal and break, they don't take false steps. 
or, you know, when they're playing press coverage, they're staying in front and not opening the gate. You know, your technique is vital to playing defensive back, and you got to do the little things right. And the little things become great gains when you look at the bigger picture. And I try to emphasize to those guys that, you know, every day you got to get better at something. But it starts with fine-tuning and conditioning your mind because if your mind's not in condition to go and play a game for four quarters, then, you know, everything else will fall apart from there, from your mind to your body and everything on down the line. Your technique will fall apart, and it, and then you're just out there playing and you're relying on athletic ability, and that's what ultimately will get you beat because I've seen a lot of defensive backs, guys that run 4-2 that, you know, you, you think, they can go out there and get it done, but they're lacking something. And I think it's always been, you know, that conditioning of their mind to be able to withstand, you know, if they give up a big catch, you know, what are their, what is their response going to be to that? Mm -hmm. uh, if you give up a touchdown, how are you going to bounce back? Or, you know, you got to be able to, to condition your mind that everything else will follow after that. And I think our guys have done a great job of picking up the, the techniques that I've been teaching. Um, you know, understanding that, again, you know, I don't want guys that go out there and do it their own way all the time. You know, I understand that some guys are different than others. I understand that, you know, throughout my career, I've had the opportunity to fail over and over and over again to find out what worked for me. So I understand that guys are going to be different. And I understand that some guys will, will accept coaching differently. So you have to work with guys individually on how to prepare them for getting the best ultimate ultimate results out of them. Yeah, I I mean as you as you say that what comes to mind with me is it it it's like the psychology of the game that the mindset a defensive back has to have because the very first thing you said was pretty much they have to have a short memory. Yes. You know, and I can see that because I have seen from the offensive side if a guy doesn't have that it's like, let's go, let's keep going at him because he's going to get exposed. And then the, you know, the sidelines yelling at him and everything's like that. Mm -hmm. And then you're less than who you are. Yep. And, and that, that's a very difficult thing to be. It's because you got, you know, it's like you, it's like a prize fighter. If he gets beat and he comes back, he's thinking about the fight. He just got beat he's not going to win the next fight. And all of a sudden he goes from being undefeated to like, he just lost three bouts in a row and and that because every play it's just one play at a time. Yep. Uh, and I and I can see that with a lot of defensive backs and that if they don't have that strong mindset, then you know it's going to be tough to play for us. Oh yeah, you, you know? got to be able to put it together for four quarters. That mindset is a major part because you know you you could get beat in the last two minutes of the fourth quarter and then go in a tank and that could cost you a game. Or you can get beat and come back from that and go make a play and then win the game. So, I mean, it, there's two different types of, of players, and you want the guys that can condition their mind to do things even when the pressure's on. No matter what the situation is, no matter what the down and distance, you have to focus on that one play and that one play, the one that, that is in front of you, not the one that, that has already happened. Yeah. And I love that. And how, how do you best get that point across? Cause you're going to have some really young defensive backs mm -hmm. coming in right now. How, how do you get that point across and, and just reiterate it throughout training camp to get them ready for what's about to happen? Well, with, with young guys, I think it's a lot easier because they're not used to doing the things that you're going to teach them. Probably. Um, a lot of them come from high school programs where there's not really a position coach for their position. And they, they may not do the, the drills that we will implement. Um, but what you do is you find out who learns which way. You know, you get guys on the board, you, you know, visual learners, you show them a film of them and critique it that way. Or you put them on the field and put them through the drills and, and then critique them that way. You know, all guys are different. Uh, but you have to condition them all the, the, as if they're in the, the fourth quarter of a game and there's a minute left and we're down by three and we need the ball back. So at the end of the day, you know, turnovers are key. And uh, but you can't take risks. You have to be you have to let the game come to you and let it flow. Don't try to go and do too much. And uh, the good thing about young guys is that th they're still new to this and you get to break them back down and start them fresh and then build them up to the guys and players that you want them to become.
No, oh, outstanding. I know we've got some good defensive backs coming in at corner safety positions. We're mm-hmm. excited to get working with those guys. And I know we've seen the film on them as we were recruiting them. And uh, it's going to be – I can't wait. You know, we're going to have a great training camp. Oh, know? yeah. It's yeah. going to be competitive for yeah, sure. It will be. And, uh, no, I think that that's – that's you know, I think as we think about the defensive backs – um, what's the slogan you like to use that you want outside of your office? What do you want to say about your your group, those defensive backs? Well, I like to call them flight patrol because, uh, you know, when you think about a defensive back, you think about them being on an island uh, all the time out there by themselves. Uh, so we, we nickname them flight patrol because – all flights are canceled and no flights are due to arrive on time. So that means that we're getting the job done and we're flying around and, and making things happen and, and canceling all the flights that come to our island. Let's go. I'm in. <laughs> I want to play now. I love it. <laughs> now, uh, as, as we wrap this up, I, I want to just let some of our fans and the community around here know, I mean, you've embraced the community. Mm-hmm. Um, in a variety of ways. Like I've, I've gone over to the YMCA and you've got, uh, you know, you're working with little kids over there, you, you know, which is right in town to give back to the community. And you've done that throughout your career as a player. Now you're doing it as a coach and give us how you feel about that part, contributing back to the community here in defiance. Well, I think that the defiance community, you know, makes it a lot easier for us to go out and, and be, uh, citizens and and role models in the community uh, guys reach out you know we kind of partner together to, and figure out a way how we can uh, help the football team be more involved in the community I think it's a big part of of what we do as a program uh, to get our players in the image of the community get those guys around people in the community that could potentially help them out um, you know whether it's jobs after football or whatever the case may be, summer jobs. There, there's a lot of people in the Defiance community that are willing to uh, reach out a helping hand to our guys, and, and that's that's big. But I think our guys have to do their part in giving back and being part of the community as well, um, whether it's helping to develop a young kid. Uh, you never know the impact that, that you can make on that kid just by being around and, uh, and encouraging them to do well, and that positive reinforcement goes a long way. I think our guys are are going to uh, with me around. I'm I'm going to you know figure out avenues, uh, different things that we can do to put our players in the spotlight of the community. Um, I talked to a guy from the Salvation Army, um, and we're going to do some things with them, uh, build something with that uh, that avenue. Um, you know the YMCA again, they were great with the Youth Flag Football League. Uh, we had the opportunity to go out there and help those young kids play and perform and. Uh, show them how to do things and I'm pretty sure they all had fun they were all excited they didn't oh, want yeah. it to end uh, but just building the community the community that we live in is you know going to be the support system for our football program and uh, and building those relationships to last a lifetime oh yeah no doubt and I've you know you know Eli my son he's he's gonna be seven years old and uh, he used to come out and just watch you work the drills and I think you had him on a bungee cord uh-huh. and uh, <laughs> teaching him the technique and uh you know, the, the kids are really the future here. And it's like, we really, we, we, I think it's without question, something that's so important to us, youth football all the way up. And it's, it's, we want to contribute to that. And, and, uh, you're a testament to what, what's going on there. Now, let me shift gears for a second. Now you live with our quarterback coach, don't you? Yes, I do. Yes. Tyler Bolin. <laughs> uh, and, uh, so, so it's sort of an interesting thing because, I'm intrigued as we, uh, from that perspective here, you're a defensive backs coach. He's coaching the quarterbacks and working with those receivers. Well, what's it like in that household? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it depends on, on what we're talking about. If we're, cause we get into it, you know, oftentimes talking football and Tyler's the type of guy, he likes to pick your brain on, you know, different route concepts and different coverage concepts and things like that. So what we do is we get the little whiteboards. We have these um, small miniature whiteboards, dry erase boards. So he'll show me a formation and then I'll draw up the defense to that formation. And then, you know, we'll kind of pick our each other's brain. He'll draw up a play and I'll draw up a defense and then we'll show it to each other and see how it all pans out to see, like, you know, how he could beat 
the defense and I see how I could beat the offense. So uh, it's it's competitive, but, you know, we have fun with it. And, and it's great to have a person like that that coaches the offensive side because it gives me a different perspective uh, on how an offensive coach thinks. And then I can go back and draw something up on how to beat that as a mm -hmm. defensive coach. Yeah, and I, I think that's great synergy. You guys are, you know, becoming have become friends. I see you wearing his West Virginia Wesleyan Bobcat shirts. He's got the Saskatchewan Rough Rider sweats on. You know, it's uh, I'm I'm always intrigued by what you guys are wearing. You know, it's just <laughs> funny how you just sort of like ah, my closet's yours. It seems like so. You know, that's good. I mean, that's what coaching is. It's a brotherhood. It's guys working together, and uh, I think our players will be excited when they come here and see the type of staff we have and the synergy. And um, to close this, uh, you talk about the next episode, and uh, that is Tyler Bowling. Well, he'll be coming in here, and I'll have to ask him the same type of question regarding you, which will be fun to hear how he deals with it. And, uh, yeah, it'll be fun. He's from the great state of West Virginia, so um, down in the almost heaven mountain mama all that's that stuff yeah that's what he says he's he probably knows the john denver song by heart so i uh, may have to have him sing it on this episode at some point but uh i i appreciate you coming on this uh javon and we will spend some more time together and you know we've got a lot of shows throughout the fall you'll be on with us and talking with some of our players so uh, thanks again and uh, for everybody out there uh, just uh, join us in the next episode with tyler bowling our quarterback coach <laughs>